There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Hey everybody, welcome to the Your Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, David Wilms. I've got Nephi Cole with me. Nice to be here, Dave. No Mike McGrady. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. No Hopefully Mike Hopefully he'll text me. Um, yeah, he might. He did. He's texted you before. Is your phone off? Nope. Would you turn your phone off <laughs> yeah. before we get started? That'd be good. Um, you might remember... We did this podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had uh, we had some state wildlife attorneys that joined us that are still with us. This is the magic of the podcast. <laughs> two weeks ago, two weeks you heard later. from them. Two weeks later, you're whoa! back with us again. Here we are. here we are. That's some commitment. Yeah. So, first of all, I'm gonna have you all introduce yourselves one more time. But then I got a question. I got to follow up on our last podcast right out of the gates. So everybody really quickly introduce yourselves one more time. Well, hello. I'm Kelly Myers. I work now for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but I was the director of Fish and Wildlife for the state of Iowa and before that, the, the general counsel over those programs. I'm Chris Timus, and I'm the chief counsel for the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism. Tamara McIntosh. I'm an attorney with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, Conservation, and Recreation Division. So I recognize we had a... So we did this podcast two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> wink, wink, right? <laughs> so we did this podcast, and we were talking about a lot of pretty specific state wildlife issues right, and things that, that we might deal with or have to interpret as... Uh, division attorneys, but we never actually asked or answered the fundamental question. Uh, what is it that you do? Or as, how did it how did it go in that movie Office Space? Is that dating all of us <laughs> to be quoting a movie from like 1999? I don't, I don't know what you're talking uh, about. Red Stapler. <laughs> Stapler. 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 Yeah. But, but what exactly do you do here? Uh, yeah. So, so we talked about all this stuff, but we didn't actually talk about on a day-to-day basis. What is your job? What do you do? I work with the customers. To go internal back to customers. Office. Yeah, right. Yeah. Internal <laughs> customers. Go back to the office. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Litigation. Blair. Legislation. Regulation. Constituent services. That's what I do. Small litigation. If it's big stuff, I'm in house. So I'm actually with the agency. I work for the agency. I don't work for the attorney general's office. So if it's big legislation or big litigation, it goes to the attorney general's office. I do legislative affairs. So I go over, I draft bills, testify in the legislature, work with legislators on their bills. Uh, Regulation, I draft regulations. So uh, everything from hunting, fish, boat, parks, uh, in our agency, uh, I take those through that process, which could take a year, it could take six months, could take two years. <clears throat> Shepherd that through that commission process. Contracts, personnel, uh, I do advise uh, law enforcement, uh, real estate transactions, and constituent services. I mean, so I am an avid outdoorsman. And so when people call and they have a complaint about something, usually it gets routed to me in my office. And so I'll deal with them because I hunt and fish, use parks and boat. I mean, you think about it, it's like a four to 600 person business, but your business is wildlife conservation or in the case of Iowa, also parks and forestry. And so you're doing everything that a general counsel of a major American corporation would do internal to your customer. Plus on top of that, you are... Uh, there's usually a, a citizen commission. There's a lot of public transparency. And so you're ensuring compliance with open records laws. Mm-hmm. You are meeting the constituent demands and questions, um, making sure that the information that you are sharing is, isn't is protected somehow because of uh, it's ecologically sensitive information or it's personnel confidential. So um, it's that kind of really weird space to operate in where you're pro- 
like I said, doing all of the business services of a what a, a, a large corporation in America would be today, or a, a big business, you know, five hundred plus business, um, but doing it in a very open public forum. But I defer to Tamara because mm-hmm. she's she's the counsel now she's in Iowa. Doing it. Yeah. yeah. So her job description would have been mine at one point. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, there's not too much to add. Um, my role is very similar to Chris's specific to the conservation and recreation division. So um, I am not general counsel for the agency, but I am de facto general counsel for that division. Um, so I'm in house as well. Um, certain litigation matters are handled by the attorney generals, um, but we will do contested cases, which is um, a hearing before an administrative law judge, usually specific to um, licenses that we may issue, um, hunt, fish, trap, um, regulated licenses as well. Sometimes, um, like commercial fishing licenses, for instance, um, and then other compliance matters with the law. Um, we mentioned in the other episode, for instance, um, hunting preserves. So if there's a compliance issue with the hunting preserves law, we would be involved in that. Um, so your agency is much broader than Mike adjustment. <clears throat> so your agency is a little broader than, so in Wyoming, um, and, and help, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people, we get used to the state that we live in and there's an assumption that, you know, everybody's state works like ours. Mm. You guys, you know, so for example, Wyoming would have a Department of Environmental Quality. So it sounds to me like your Department of Environmental Quality, which handles, you know, in Wyoming, they handle, for example, the Clean Water Act. Whereas, whereas Mm -hmm. you guys, you know, but, but they don't handle game and fish issues. That's game and fish. Right. So we're one agency, but we're split in half, Mm -hmm. but we're housed under the same umbrella. Mm-hmm. So we have a director for the Department of Natural Resources, and then we have two division administrators, one for the environmental pollution regulation mm-hmm. side of the agency, and then one for the conservation and regulation. So right. environmental pollution is going to be your Clean Water Act, your Clean Air Act, your contaminated sites, leaking underground storage tank, et cetera. And then the conservation and recreation is going to be your parks, water trails, yep. wildlife, forestry, fisheries, See, conservation and officers. And in some states, it's even, again, Wyoming bifurcated even more. So in right. Wyoming, we have a state parks, which is where the Alf Office of Outdoor Recreation is within mm-hmm. state parks. And so it's just kind of different there. Well, and then there's there's mm-hmm. other differences. Like, so each of you have been in-house embedded in an agency as the in-house counsel for that agency. But that's not how all wildlife agencies work. Right. Because some have attorney general. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I was representing the Wyoming game and fish department, I was working for the attorney general's office and I was assigned an agency Mm -hmm. to be counsel for. So I handled all of the litigation. Uh, Whereas, uh, you know, it sounds like you all might have handled some of it, but some Mm -hmm. other cases went to the attorney general's office. Mm -hmm. The, our game and fish did not have in-house counsel. So I became, you know, de facto, Mm -hmm. like general counsel, retained general outside general counsel, Mm -hmm. but really working for the agency through the attorney general's office. So there's a lot of models for it. What I was going to add in Pennsylvania, they actually have the attorney general, but they also have the office of general counsel. And so the state attorneys who work in the agencies don't work for the agencies, but they don't work for the attorney general's office. They actually work for an office of general counsel, which is a separate agency outside of the other agencies. And now I'm a fish. We're officially in the weeds. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so oh, this is what lawyers do though. Yeah, I know. So, mm-hmm. Kelly, now, so how do we, we get out? <laughs> I want to ask Kelly a little bit. You know, we talked about like States. You have a distinction now where you work for us fish and wildlife service. Yes. What's the change? Like what's your perspective now? And, and, and the listeners, most of them, this is going to be new to a lot of the listeners. Because there's this assumption, you know, we, we get comfortable in our space and we think everything's the same. So we assume that what works in our state is actually how every state works and that that's actually how it works nationally. But it's actually not. There's actually, I mean, 50 different ways of doing business, right, that are all locally specific to meet local needs. And then you step to the federal level. That's where you're at now. Yes. And what's funny is when I first took this job, I was telling some of my family members You know, I'm I'm leaving the state of Iowa. I'm going to work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they didn't understand how my job was different. Mm -hmm. Because in their minds, they didn't really distinguish that there's a federal fish and wildlife agency and a state fish and... And isn't it all the same thing? And, you know, to some of my closest friends, 
they don't know. They don't distinguish the two. So I was having to explain to them the, you know, the differences. But really in my job now, I work very closely with the states. And my whole job is to coordinate kind of large landscape level conservation activities across state lines. So if I can, I'd actually like you, you know, assume that we're your relatives. <laughs> Teach our listeners, what is the difference? So what is the difference going from state now, you know, make the assumption that we don't know. Tell us how you move from being state wildlife management agency. Tell us about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So just like the state fish and wildlife agencies, you know, the service is a, a creature of statute. And so it's given authorities by Congress. Um, the ones that people are most familiar with are, you know, authority over um, endangered species. People might think about migratory birds. Um, and so there's a, a group of, of um, uh, functions kind of outside of what we would consider traditional fish and wildlife or game management activities that the service is uniquely situated to handle. And at the same time, um, I think working on uh, trying to develop the best decision support tools for good, healthy fish and wildlife management, working with the states as kind of that primary partner um, in fish and wildlife you know, my job, I work across, you know, fish and wildlife don't understand geopolitical boundaries. And so I'm working on large landscape level issues. You know, you think of monarch butterfly, you think of pollinators. Um, we're, we're looking at how can we Most help. Most people don't, by the way. I know. You said you think of these things. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but, but it's great that we have people that are thinking of these things. Right. And so, you know, we're always, you know, in my role, I'm very cognizant of what is my what is my authority to be acting in a place? And right now, a lot of it is we're trying to work on some good voluntary conservation measures so that at-risk species don't become threatened or endangered, so that we have healthy fish and wildlife resources beyond just the game we talk about. It's, it's, it's everything. And so I work with broad collaborations across states, across non-governmental organizations, um, to just try to make sure that we're leveraging each other, working together together, in a, with limited resources. I mean, you think about how many resources we all have available to do this work. There's the North American model. There's some appropriations that come into it, but it's, it's never enough. And so how do we make sure that the precious dollars that we do get for conservation are spent in the most appropriate ways possible in ways that we're complementing one another and we're working together? I think that's the goal that everyone has. It's, it's how do we actually do that? So do you see yourself as kind of a facilitator in a way? My official title is coordinator. Mm -hmm. So, yes, very much so. I, I facilitate conversations, um, and it's because there's willingness on, on the parts of all parties involved to come to a table and talk about these big issues. You know, it's a, it's a growing area of resource management, this idea of collaborative conservation, right. right? I mean, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. That's what you do, right? Right. And, you know, we had a in, in the West, sage grouse has been the big example for so many years uh, of a, a massive multi-state collaborative conservation effort. Uh, and we always had the saying, you know, what's, what's good for the bird is good for the herd, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you manage the habitat the right way for wildlife, then people can benefit too, you know, as in we still can have livestock on the range, right? And we can't and, manage a single species and we, we can't, can't manage a single site. And so that's exactly right. How can we, you know, uh, the, of course, there are always going to be those specialist species that need, you know, a little bit more attention. But how can we really find those places where when we're when we're working together, it's 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 having benefits across. So it's kind of getting past the idea of individual species management to landscape level management, recognizing that you might have, you know, a hundred obligate species, a hundred species that are completely dependent on one habitat type. And if you, if you do work on the habitat and it, and you do work on a large area of the habitat that might go across day lines, you can do a lot more good than by trying to focus efforts on just one species. Right. And when we're talking about that, we, it's, it's so many organizations. So it's not just Wyoming doing it alone in a vacuum. It's all of the different groups who are operating in that landscape, including non-traditional partners. So we've been really working to get the energy sector or the agricultural sector or the groups to say, here's how you can be part of this. Because with, you know, in my time in Iowa, I was looking at all of these maps that were purple and red with, here's where we need to be concerned about monarchs and pollinators. 
And, and I knew that the constituents in my state were going to demand that we as the Fish and Wildlife Agency were doing something to prevent listing of those species that could then cost them real money if they, if they had to mitigate for them. Not just money, in some cases, livelihood. Correct. Yeah. And so we built consortiums and coalitions of people coming to the table to say, what can we do now um, before the decisions is t- they're taken out of our hands? And so we built these voluntary coalitions that are now all over the country. You know, Sage Grouse, you, you know, you talk about that. There's all these great models. Um, but it's also like getting, you know, rights of way sectors out there, um, totally different groups than your traditional conservation groups to come and be part of the solution because it impacts them too. Yeah. Operating in good faith is a principle, you know, that, that works, you know, getting, getting people around the table and taking ownership of problems or opportunities and, and, and everybody weighing in and saying, Hey, look, you know, we can do things the right way. It's always more effective to have those groups working on a solution than it is to have a group of quote unquote experts come in later and tell you what you have to do. It's much better to start from the ground up with this collaborative effort to you know get on get on board with each other and get work done. And you know, what I, the, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say I, I think it's important too to say that collaboration isn't consensus. I mean, we might never have complete agreement on what we think each other's jurisdictions are or what we think they ev- even the real problem is, but it's at least coming to the table and agreeing that we're, we're going to come in good faith and we're going to try to work through some of these issues. We're going to operate in those places where we can in that direction. And, and it might be that for a brief second, you find that, that consensus. Yeah. You that don't have, and you don't have to cons- have consensus on everything. Exactly. You can, there's that 80%. There's, there's a sweet spot. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So we try to operate. That's what I'm trying to do is find those places and kind of capitalize on them and, 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 move the needle a little bit that's that's neat thank you i was just going to chime in and it might be interesting for some of your listeners and i don't know if you guys have found this to be the case as well but when i went to law school and i was thinking about wanting to be involved in the environment i was thinking in terms of the environmental pollution regulation i didn't realize that natural resources law the way that we are actively practicing it was a career option and so i think some of your listeners might be excited to know that if you're passionate about outdoor recreation and conservation and being an advocate for the resources, um, legal has an important part in all of that. You are, in fact, the advocate. And I think sort of the colloquial explanation of my job to people is I am the attorney for the state parks in Iowa. I am the attorney for the wildlife biologists who are out there protecting and growing and propagating these species that you love seeing the roam, roam on the hillside. Um, I mean, obviously there's, you know, more to it than that, but that's sort of like the high level and, and people can relate to that and get excited about it. And, um, and when I go to, um, the law school that's in Des Moines, Drake and talk to students who are interested in environmental law they they don't realize that it's an option to be an attorney for a state park system before the wildlife bureau or the forestry or fisheries, um, Let's be clear, Tamara. There are limited opportunities because one of us has to die or yes. get fired. <laughs> right. It's you like know. the Yellowstone judge. It's not a judge. good thing yes. when it opens up. Yeah, Do you exactly. guys know about this Yellowstone judge? Yeah, the like magistrate a- judge yes. that lives in, yeah, he lives so, in yes. Yellowstone so in there, Hot Springs. Is that a golden ticket? It, How do you get that it's job? It's a three-quarter yes. time mm-hmm. federal, uh, federal magistrate judge mm-hmm. right? that yep. lives in Mammoth, Mammoth Hot, Hot Springs, Springs right. and yep. Yellowstone. So yep. on the northeast <clears throat> corner of Yellowstone. Right. Their court is in the park. Their jurisdiction yes. is the, the boundary park. of the park. Yep. Does it, and for everyone outside of this conversation like me who just stepped into like <laughs> <laughs> five attorneys dream like apparently this is like this is uh, apparently this is like a gold nugget secret that all oh attorneys know about but nobody outside of that profession does. Yeah. Can, can you imagine? Can you imagine being able to have a job where they actually pay you. Mm-hmm. They pay you good money to live, live in, Yellowstone. in Yellowstone. They right? have right. those jobs. They call them rangers. I said good money. Right. No, that's a... I mean, 
we've all been to Yellowstone, right? I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Oh, I know, ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, I'm and I like, love it. He makes like sit in the boiling river letters. on your lunch <laughs> have break. You, so have he you really been to Yellowstone? Because last time I was there, I was in like about ten traffic jams. Oh, Let's see. No, so this guy oh, but this is great. <laughs> <laughs> because Tamara's really been to Yellowstone. Oh, oh that's right. What was nice. that? Hey, 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 you like that segue? Yeah, 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 yeah I, I, it's like we're learning how to do this. Right. Right? Yeah. So you took a trip to Yellowstone, what? Yeah, what 2016. Um, and this is a, a hike anybody can do. Um, I actually have a really good friend who is um, a ranger at Yellowstone. And so he actually clued us into this. Um, hike. It's in the south um, east corner of the park in the Belcher area. Um, it's a trail. It's the Belcher River Trail. And what's wonderful about this hike is that you can access um, one of a few uh, thermal alkaline thermal pools that you can actually sit in. Now, to be clear, this is actually a really important point. It is illegal to sit in thermal pools in Yellowstone. Yes, don't do this. Right. But, or you'll end up before the magistrate and he'll make or, you write a letter or, about why right. that's <laughs> right. or, or dead. Which is yes, that's be. right. We but had you can yeah. access rivers. Mm-hmm. And this pool, as well as a few others that you can access in Yellowstone, um, you're, you're, you're technically in the river. Like the Firehole River, for right. example, for that, which is a that's, commonly known one right. to tourists that they go and you can swim in. And right. there are thermal features that right. so it's, raise the temperature. Of the that's water. right. It's like pooling yeah. into the river and raising the temperature. Um, so the pool that we went to is called Mr. Bubbles. It's worth a Google. It's gorgeous. Look at the images. Um Mr. How, how deep in, in the Mr. park Mr. Bubbles. Yes. I'm writing it in my notes. Yes, Mr. it's Bubbles. worth going to. Just so give you a location. There's, um, yeah. You have some options. You can do a through hike from um, Belcher Ranger Station to Old Faithful, and I believe that's 32 miles. Or you can go in and out. And we went from Belcher Ranger Station, and I think it was eight miles it was either six or eight miles to where we camped um and we camped there two nights and you're going to pass some amazing waterfalls on the route so and yellowstone is absolutely known i mean yes. it's a it's a well-kept secret or maybe not a well-kept secret yes. but everybody th- when they think of yellowstone mm-hmm. they think of the thermal features they think That's of the bison right. they think of the grizzly bears mm-hmm. but one of the things yellowstone has is a remarkable number of waterfalls and in fact yes there are it, this is such a remote area. I mean, for as many tourists yes. a, as visit Yellowstone a year, something like two million, two and a half million tourists visit Yellowstone every year, right? And there's this figure eight loop that runs through the park. Most people have probably been to the park, right? right. When you get off of that park, off of that roadway, it's incredibly remote, mm-hmm. and there are amazing waterfalls all over this park yes. that as recently as a few years had never been right. discovered. Right. They're right? finding new They're ones finding all the time. The, and we're not talking about little trickles of waterfalls. Like no. A few years ago, um, you probably keep up on this, right? Somebody discovered a 100-foot waterfall <laughs> in Yellowstone that had never yep. been mapped before. Huh. Yeah, right? And incredible. in the days of Google Earth and all this stuff, it, it just right. it blows my mind. Mm-hmm. When we have 320 million people in this country and 200 or and, and two and a half million people visiting this park every year, and we're we're still discovering right. 100 foot tall waterfalls. Yeah, no, it's incredible. It's amazing. So, right. um, yeah. So on this particular um, hike, even if you just go from Belcher to Mister Bubbles and back, you're going to pass two. Stunning waterfalls, a colonnade and iris. Colonnade is a double waterfall. Um, and so then we, we camped there. And then from the campsite, I can't recall its number, but you do need to have a permit if anybody wants to replicate this trip. Very important. Um, it was, I believe, two to two and a half miles to Mr. Bubbles, which we just did as a day outing. So we went to Mr. Bubbles and then came back. Um, Mr. Bubbles, you will head off the main Belcher River Trail, and it's about a half mile down to the thermal feature. Um, and I believe it's the Ferris Fork off of the Belcher River. 
Um, but you are sitting in this glorious hot tub water and the river's flowing by you and steam is coming out of the ground all around you and you're surrounded by pine trees and you're just completely isolated and it's a magical, magical experience. And that is why we do what we do. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. 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 That is why we do what we and, do. And you will never see it if you're not willing to schlep yourself in you know, 10 miles round trip. Well, and I think that's something, I mean, I know those of us here, we all get out in the resource, whether mm -hmm. it's with our staffs mm -hmm. or on our personal time, all of us think it, I mean, I know that when I first started practicing in Iowa with my new clients and going out and trying to build their trust, it wasn't going to be over a conference table sitting in Des Moines in a, in a, in a, in the, in the headquarters office, it was going to be out at a wildlife management area, walking it with them, seeing what they're dealing with and feeling it with them. And so, right. you know, we made a point to get out a lot and, and meet yeah. people out where they were. And, mm -hmm. and I could get away from email and right. if you're going to work with the resource, That's right. you need to know the resource right. and right. you don't know the resource mm -hmm. by reading a textbook or by reading statutes, or by reading regulations. I mean, you you learn the law, you can learn how to apply the law, but you don't really develop that passion right. and really learn the resource mm -hmm. until you go out into the resource. And the other part of that is the people, like all the people who are managing the resource mm -hmm. or using mm -hmm. the resource. Because really everything we do isn't really about managing wildlife. It's about managing people and their expectations and their use of. And so if we have to know all the people who are part of all this equation too. And so getting out there, mm -hmm. understanding how this waterfowler wants to use this, this water, knowing how that wildlife biologist sees this is critical to our success. I think as I listen to you guys talk about this, I, I have a perception that may be wrong, but it's interesting. I think that, I can almost see two different, you know, trying to be objective, two different sides of like how people approach this. I think you guys very much, I think you hit it, Kelly, when you said like, we look at the people and manage the people, you know, cause that, you know, ultimately you know, that's how it affects the resource where I think that most of the users, you know, people, they, they come at it from the other, the other side. And it's almost a very unique view. Like basically you're putting your problems on the table in front of us all and you know trying to attack these problems but it's like you guys have to come uh, from a from a from you you come out from a very unique and different angle than maybe the angler would and you know, who comes out who starts out you know purely interested in the kind of fish they want or their favorite species that they want to protect you know they don't see it i think the way that you just described it i think that's very unique the idea that you know we need to manage people and people's expectations whereas the people who are out there I mean, they're kind of viewing it differently, and I think that's – I've never considered that. We do <clears> – <throat> I think we do that all the time because mm -hmm. when we talk about harvesting fish or deer, really what it boils down to is we don't – we're managing in Kansas, for example. Every Kansas resident can get over-the-counter buck tag. <clears throat> so theoretically, you we know statistically we're going to fill 55 to 60 percent of those tags. Does it matter if they are filled in archery season or rifle season? Or are we going to manage bullet types to the nth degree? That's people management. It's trying to satisfy your customer and still uh, achieve what you need to achieve to keep your herd in balance, right? Yeah. I mean, a great example in right. in Western states is, <clears throat> and it's probably the same in, in your states as well, it's... You know, there's a social tolerance for uh, the number of, and, and, and I'll use big game as an example. There's a social tolerance for the number of elk on a landscape, it, but the social tolerance is different depending on who you talk to, mm -hmm. right? So if you talk to hunters, the social tolerance is for maximum as, as many as, many as, many as, you, as can you can have, have on the habitat. If you talk to landowners, the social tolerance might be a lot lower. They don't mind having elk there, but those elk are are impacting it's competition. their it's competition right and so it's it's balancing those needs for example and people might say well why would you balance the needs against the 
uh, the hunter or the public that wants to see a lot of elk for the landowner. And I'd say, well, the landowner is providing an, they're providing the habitat, right? And you have to consider that because if we lose the landowner, then what do we wind up with? Well, I don't know where it is, how it is in Iowa, but when we lose the landowner in Wyoming, we, we wind up with a lot more landowners, meaning that ranch gets bought up and it gets subdivided and everybody owns their little piece of paradise at the base of the mountains. You know, and then you have a lot fewer elk or you have a lot more conflicts. And so you're, you're constantly dealing with those balancing issues. I was party, you know, listening to a recent discussion and, and this, I mean, Dave, you really hammered at home. Like, I think what is a, a challenge that we all face and um, this, this discussion, I was listening to some guys talk about wild sheep and they were talking about wild sheep and they're talking about, you know, sheep populations, sheep herds, wild sheep herds. And they said, yeah, um, but then, you know, wild sheep and then we really you know it's an an aspirational you know hunt guys want to go hunt these sheep there's only x number of tags very few in each state and then they started talking about you know the sheep industry and they and then they're like yeah but the sheep industry it's small and so uh, it's interesting when you look at the viewpoints of those of those different people you have like x number of sheep tags which may not you know and then you have x number of families and looking at it from the viewpoint of the person who wants to go on a once in a lifetime sheep hunt. But then you're looking at a ranching family who that literally is their life and their life livelihood forever. Well, and don't forget about the third piece. There's the third segment of the population that, that doesn't hunt, that, drives, that doesn't ranch, that, that lives in a subdivision. Right. Where they, that wants to see that wildlife on the landscape. Yeah. And you have to, or but, not. Yeah, but if you're an early morning driver and you don't want to have no, or, deer in the ditch that sure. you're going to hit. Sure, I mean there's there's uh there's That's just the so category. yeah that, that we just, I guess we could create unlimited categories and that kind of drives the point home, right? right? That it's a a balancing act. So it, it goes to I think our role, going back to the original, you know, kind of our role as attorneys is we're always mediating. We're always trying to find that balance. And sometimes it's litigation. Sometimes it's contested cases. Sometimes it gets to that point where we have to get a neutral to come in and help resolve something either because of the law or the situation. But I think a lot of times it's, it's counseling the client who might be the director or staff on trying to seek, mediate that balance. Sometimes it's just listening to the public who wants right. to have somebody that, so they call up. They don't have an expectation that you're going to get something accomplished or do anything to help them. They just want somebody to listen. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just listen. That's Absolutely. how that works. And, you know, that is one form of mediation, right? So let me ask you, do you enjoy what you do? Yes. I wouldn't do anything I love else. It. I yeah. love it every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you encourage others to get into it? There's limited space. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is you guys talked about... Opportunities in Kansas. <laughs> you, you talked about this. You didn't know you could do this, you know, being mm -hmm. an attorney for wildlife. Uh, when I was in... Uh, when I started my collegiate career, my goal was to be... I was going to go to law school. Mm. Interestingly enough, I made the choice later on. There was a, you know, there was a, a crossroads where it was either law school or grad school. So here I am, you know, I've worked you know, for six years for a governor as, you know, and as senior policy staff, I don't anymore. So I'm comfortable saying that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, there was a, you know, I was a, I was a biologist, right. For most of my career, I was, I was working for the natural resource conservation service. And it's interesting. I thought you were a soil scientist. I was a, so oh, I started my career as man, a, just... I started my career as a soil scientist. Then, uh, be, was a officially, you know, when you look at the, you go look at my resume, my classifications. I was a, a biologist. There's was a 401 GS. So uh, when you guys have those, uh, I don't even remember what the, you know, when you when you send me job applications now from the federal government, I can qualify as a 401, a 457, and something else. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> I don't have any idea what that is, any of that means. Yeah, well, um, it's kind of down in the weeds, Nephi. Yeah, You're getting, speaking of the like, weeds, right. so us on the rebel. Speaking Although of Kelly, is a soil. Scientist. Yeah, I was one of four soil science majors at the University really? of Missouri. Yeah. Well, but then I wanted right. to go to law school, and I didn't want to wait for that last Kindred soil spirits. physics <laughs> class. So I just well, have a general degree. We'll talk about jellosols. <gasps> Maybe histosols. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> get a room. <laughs> <laughs> Man, soil scientists, so you think you know somebody. Right. <laughs> and water quality. Yeah, well, you two can talk about that, too. 
Uh, that sounds, I mean... It's <laughs> cool. It is. Well, I want to talk about water, but I want to talk about... I want to, I want to pivot here. I want to talk... Mm-hmm. At, during the last podcast, I mentioned an experience I had recently with it involved water, mainly because that's what I was casting into to right. catch fish. A cast and blast. A cast and blast, right? <laughs> so... Where did we leave off? It, we left off with not telling any of the story. I don't think right? we yeah, you were coming to a cousin's a wedding. wedding. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. So coming to a cousin's and wedding. Dave has a lot of cousins. I do have quite a few cousins. Marrying each other. <laughs> on the Dove opener. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> Just His cousin was not marrying a cousin. <laughs> you really want to go down this road? No, cuz. <laughs> no, because I'm about to take the gloves off. Um. Anyway, I had a cousin getting married and uh, in Kansas City, which is where you all are living. Or not all of you, but Chris, you live in Kansas City. Yeah. Kelly, you live in Kansas City. Um, so I reached out and said, hey, I'm coming through coming through Kansas City. Maybe we can grab lunch. Right? And the original plan was we were just going to have some lunch. And I was going to go to this wedding and going to have lunch on a Friday, I think. Best barbecue in Kansas City. That was the plan, right? That was the plan. Yeah. Hey. And I was pretty excited about it. Well, I was going to take my whole family with me. My family, they all, like, everybody got sick. Like, you name it. They got it. I got little kids. Uh, wife got sick. Kids got sick. Our My uh, mother-in-law, who's going to be our babysitter for the kids, got sick. And so I wound up coming out by myself. So I called Chris up and said, look, I'm, I'm not going to be not going to be there for lunch on Friday. Maybe we can meet on Saturday for lunch. And uh, And you say, well... I suppose we could, but it'll have to be in in central Missouri, <laughs> right? Because uh, because we're going to go do some uh, opening day dove hunting, uh, maybe a little bass fishing, and you should come with. And I was sort of I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe. And I'm sort of developing this philosophy as I get a little bit older that, and we've talked about this before. Life is all about experiences, right? Don't waste and, a weekend. And and I had this philosophy a couple of years ago. I had no wasted weekends. <laughs> Hashtag no wasted weekends. That's mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, trademark. Yeah, trademark. Uh-huh. Uh, patent pending. Something like that. Legal bunch of legal jargon. Um, yeah. So I had this. I had this. Philo- I'm developing this philosophy of, you know, you know, take opportunities when they present themselves, right? right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And don't this, say no to the bear hunt. Right. <laughs> we'll get to uh, that. The outcome. We, we'll get to that. So, so we, so you, you convinced me to do this, and I have to scramble around in the middle of the night to try and get myself a license because I got all these commitments early on. I put my head on my pillow. I don't even remember what time it was. It was one o'clock in the morning, o'clock. something like that. And I had to get up at two thirty, two forty-five, get in the car and drive down. So I got an hour and a half of sleep. Got and you made car. all these arrangements before you, after you left. So. No hunting clothes, no weapons. No yeah, I was prepared to go to no a wedding. Guns. I wasn't prepared no to fishing do, pools. I was prepared right. to do nothing else. Uh, Chris provided me, yeah, you know, everything. He outfitted me for this whole whole deal. Uh, you know, I I was I did not walk in looking the part of a hunter. Let's put it that way. Uh, we show up and we do a dove hunt in the morning, right? So we get we get started early, and I would call the dove hunting marginal. At best, it was, it was good. We shot. We did some shooting. Uh, we shot some doves. Went to breakfast. And then you we tracked just, a dove. I, I have <laughs> never done this in my life. It, We're down at the other end. <laughs> yeah, so Kelly and I are, are shooting next to each other. Kelly shoots a dove. We, we so And we see it fall. And we see it fall into a tree row 50 yards from us, something like that. So we go in after it. Nothing. I mean, we must have looked for... Feathers and some blood. Feathers and a drop of blood, right? We looked we looked for 10 minutes for this right. dove, something like that, and then we just kind of gave up. And people are shooting. People and are so sh- we're feeling like we're missing out. Yeah. So like we, there's yeah. doves coming in. Get yeah. Back. So we go back, and then, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes later, I'm like, this is, this is bothering me. I watched that it dove right fall. Down. I saw it fall. Yeah, I saw it fall. It's got to be there. So we go, I'm, like, I'm going back in. And Kelly says, okay, I'll come with you. Uh, I'm like, we, we're going to find this thing. And I actually cut, no joke, I cut a bloodline. <laughs> you found a trail. <laughs> I found a blood trail for a dove. And like it I, bled out. <laughs> it like, had, had no blood like, left in its body. Right, like half, I, I assumed they had you like half think. a dozen drops total, right? <laughs> I cut a bloodline and I tracked this dove uh, and found it. Yeah. Uh, Victory. Anyway, 
that was a little side story. My first ever dove tracking. <laughs> <laughs> but we recovered the dove. Right. So good job. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so then, all two bites of it. <laughs> it was worth it though, because I hate you know that I feeling. I hate lose an that feeling of losing it an animal. If it's a squirrel or if it's a dove, you or got it or an elk. elk. I mean, right. it doesn't matter what it is. It's still an animal. You don't want to lose an animal. And it will play, yeah, right. And it just and it just eats it. Yeah, and it was you. that dove was kind of eating at me because I watched it hit the ground. Like I know it's there, uh, so we found it. Uh, anyway, we finished up our dove hunt, went out and had a nice greasy breakfast, and then uh, like did a middle of the day. Heat of the day. <laughs> heat of the day, like 90 degree sweltering heat of the day, sun blaring down on you, you know, just like baking. Like you can, you, if I had a spoon, I could suck the water out of the air in the right. spoon, right? It was, it was so hazy. thick. And it was hazy, right? Hot, miserable, kind of yeah. uncomfortable. This is a guy from early, Wyoming. <laughs> early, yeah. Early <laughs> September. Early September, Missouri day. We're like, let's go bass fishing at noon. <laughs> <laughs> so, whatever. Yeah, all right. Don't and say no. <laughs> don't say don't. It's all about experiences. Right? We fished four ponds, four irrigation lakes. Yeah, yeah we, we pond jumped. My college roommates. We did. Yeah, family property. Yeah. So we, but we started at this first pond, and you hooked me up because, like I said, wasn't prepared for anything. Didn't have any fishing equipment. Anything you even like tied that. Tied your lure on that. I tied my lure on. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You didn't babysit me. You provided me some gear. I tied my own lure on. Anyway, if you believe that. Anyway. <laughs> And you know, swing back. <laughs> first cast. First cast. Right, hits the water like immediately. It's like fish on. Bam. Boom, hit it. Fish on. Like and, braggart. And and then I <laughs> I feel hit and I set the hook again. Uh, and I just assumed you know, fish hits it. Missed the first strike. It came back. Hit it again. Hit it that second time. I'm reeling in. It's you know, it's fighting. I get it in murky water so you got to get in pretty close and i I just nonchalantly i think uh, as it's pulling up i'm like oh i have two fish and so we think this is some wyoming way of saying it's a big fish it's like yeah okay (laughs) i I legitimately on one lure now (laughs) granted it was so two treble hooks on the lure right uh one lure landed two bass Good two size. large mouth Good bass, size. nice, size. One nice lure. size. One lure, two First nice cast. bass. That's like two pounds. Probably yeah. each one was probably about yeah. two pounds. Yeah, and then on my second, third cast, caught caught bass again. So four fish on three casts. Mic drop. <laughs> go home. Never fishing <laughs> again. Never <laughs> fishing <laughs> again. That pond. Chris got, got skunked. skunked at that pond. He did. Uh, <laughs> well, he, he and he my called. college roommate Adam got skunked. <laughs> yeah. Too. Yeah. But you I made up fish. for it. You made up for it. You made up I for did. it. I got uh, lucky on the third pond. Third pond. I mean, I caught fish at the second pond, but the third pond was first first cast, lure hits the water, set the hook, and then start reeling. And then about 20 feet out, I could see this fish come out of the water with its mouth. I'm like, oh, this is a big bass. Got it in. Seven pound. Okay, but I want to, so here's what I'm going to say. You say it's a seven pounder. Could be an eight. <laughs> it could have been a nine, or it could have been a six. You, you, you I'm put, using statistics. You put the tape measure on it, so you knew it was a twenty-three inch bass. And I'm willing twenty-three and a half inch. Twenty-three and a half inch. Okay. And I'm willing to concede that it was a twenty-three and a half inch bass. But then you went to the old interwebs, I and you're looked like, at you're like, Fish and Wildlife Agency. You're like, I've statistics. extrapolated based on this size. This must be a 14-pound bass. That's not true. You said a 7-pound bass. Yeah. It was a nice fish, but we can't actually verify how much it You're was. right. It would have been like 7.68 <laughs> according to the charts. Are you questioning the use of statistics? <laughs> yes, I am. Actually. That's right. <laughs> There's only like 5,000 fish that have gone into those formulas for Florida and New York. What else did I use? Texas. Did you use Missouri? Because we were fishing hey, in Missouri. Right. I don't know if Missouri Dave, had that data available Dave online. Dave will argue. I mean, no, really. Dave, no, Dave will argue kidding? anything. <laughs> anything. It was I mean, a nice fish. I've known him for, <laughs> I don't know. It was, it was a nice fish, but did you catch two fish on one cast? No, I, I certainly don't think didn't. so. I, I don't certainly think so. didn't. I, I mean, agree. All right. All right. <laughs> On my rod that I tied on your lure for. I tied on my own lure. <laughs> Man. But weren't you guys both successful with the cutthroat 
competition. Oh, oh. Nice pivot. Nice. Yeah, nice pivot. No, we got to go back yeah. to Utah. <clears throat> so if people remember, if you've been listening to this podcast since the beginning, first of all, if you haven't, you should. Go back. And Go listen. back, listen to the beginning. And if you have, we're sorry. And if you <laughs> if you haven't been listening since the beginning, go back and start listening from the beginning. Subscribe to this podcast. Rate, Rate it. this podcast. Right. And leave us a comment on this podcast. Um, really could use the help. It, it helps us out a lot. Gets helps get the word out. Um, mean a lot to us if you went out there and did all those three things, right? Go back to uh, the... Oh, it would have been one of our first episodes. Probably I think our, it was number one. Number no, three. No, it was our third one. Who's your third? Third. Oh, that's right. We had Braden Shepherd from, from Utah in. And we, we talked. Who we all know. Who we all know. Mm-hmm. And we talked to him. Uh, we were talking to him about some public lands issues. He always catches the biggest fish when you fish with him. Right, he's like, hey, he, come fish with me. He's and, like, well, he's, and you go over there and I'm going to yeah, come over here. He, he, he invi- invites you out and he's like, let me test out this hole first before you. <laughs> right. He does <laughs> before do that. You your line, right? He's like, I just want to make huh. sure that there are no snakes around here. I'm just I'm protecting you all. Uh, <laughs> he probably oh, is too. He's oh like such a good guy. He is a good guy, yes. but he's protective. Maybe he's a little game hoggy. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I think he's a game hog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't we, think. I know. Yeah. We love you, Braden, but you're a game hog. Right. <laughs> uh, but if you go back to that, you remember we had a, a – I maybe went off on a slight diatribe mm-hmm. about the Utah cut slam. Yeah. Because they have four man. species there. Don't get me fired up. The bear, it's <laughs> the, the bear. bear river that bear. you have a problem with. I do have a problem with that. Yeah. I and believe the science shows that they have four species. I actually believe the science I'm gonna is go with Chris. inconclusive. I feel like that's where it. I got the stinging oh. nettles. Remember yes. when I fell on the sting? I think it was uh-huh. when we were in the bear. Anyway, the four of us, <laughs> the four of us all did this fishing together. Four, when I say four of you, like you not five Nephi. Yes. Yeah, no, the four attorneys. The four, the four attorneys did this yes. together. And Brayden. <laughs> and Brayden. So five attorneys. This, is a, this isn't a uh, joke, was, everyone. This really happened. Four, five attorneys, one into a river. And- five attorneys <laughs> like fishing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, what do you call five attorneys at the bottom of the river? Yeah. A good start. Good start. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you, what's the difference between a dead lawyer and a dead snake in the road? There's skid marks skid in front marks, of the snake. Yeah, yeah. 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 we Okay, yeah. yeah, we got that out of the All way. All I know yeah. is that first day I ended up face down in the stream. I came up <laughs> out of the river covered in mud with a broken rod. Mm-hmm. Everyone was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I was happy. I, mean, I had a good time. I yeah. totally did it to myself. So, you know, what are you going to do? That Made was up for it hilarious. The day. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, and uh, Tamara was pregnant what? at the time. What? Out right. there fishing, getting yeah. after it. Right? That's right. How many did you catch? Uh, how many different species? I don't count the Bear River because that doesn't I count. I think only two. <laughs> like, I didn't, I wasn't even, I think I, I think I only got two. Yeah. But. And so. College dry. Right, we so just have to go back. Yeah, we do have right? to go back. Um, but that's a, it's a long ways. To, I I like. But Utah you have to go get the Yellowstone in Utah, which is like the farthest northwest. Mm. Yeah, that's tough. We got that one. Yeah, we. That's yeah, why I'm not going back with you to do that. To. I'm not going to ride out. Yeah, no, I wasn't. Oh, it was I've super, caught a, it was I've caught a million too. Yellowstone. Yeah, that doesn't count because it, wasn't, cause in it Utah. wasn't in Utah. But the ones I caught were probably four times as big because everything I caught in Utah was like as long as my finger. Their name I, is No, I feel like I had to steal the <laughs> fish out of like a cow's <laughs> mouth because it was like drinking at this little stream I was at. And I was like, get out of here, cow. And yeah. Yeah. Whapping it like with the... On the Yellowstone ever, cut Have there. you ever had one of those experiences where you're, you're fly casting and you're fishing a little stream and it's like you're doing everything you can just to not hook into the willow and and so you're you tend to rush yourself a little bit you don't even realize for that all you have listeners a, since you can't see what's going oh, on I'm here fly casting. Dave is, <laughs> uh, Dave is he's fly he's pumping his hand back and forth Ten and right here. I, can't, I can't it's like i it's like instinctive i'm i'm stripping the line I'm, yeah <laughs> it's like i just can't it's help on, the reel's on upside down but like, now i'm left-handed <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I can't help myself but you know you're fishing in those really tight spots and these were really really tight spots and tiny tiny fish and so you're you're getting in there, and sometimes you're you're worried where your fly is going to land. You're worried you're going to hit something, so you're ri- you're ripping it back pretty quick, so you don't get hooked on something. Well, you know, like half a dozen times that happened, and I caught something, and you flick it back, and you watch that fish, <laughs> like it's, it's like it's like that slow motion feel. Like, get know. a picture of it; it counts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like you pull that line out of the water, and there happened to be a like a two inch, three inch cutthroat trout on your fly and you don't even feel it and you whip back so far 
and then it's like halfway in the back cast you realize you've you're watching killed. this fish sail behind right. you <laughs> and it gets to the back point of your cast when you're bringing it back and you're like i think that fish is a goner yeah. <laughs> uh, Take a big that 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 happened several times to me yes. did that happen to you yes yeah. mm-hmm. we had i remember the third stop i could not i could see the fish I had every, like, I had two guys, Chris and this other guy, were sitting there tying every kind of different... See, I'm used to tying lures on <laughs> Dave. And I would just sit, th- because we were just, we could see these couple of fish right there, and we were just trying to get the right thing in front of it to get them to bite. And then, finally, the one guy had needed to go up and, and talk with the rest of the group, so Chris and I stayed back, and we're trying to get this fish, and we keep on trying all these different, these different you flies. You didn't try a worm, did you? We didn't have them. Yeah, we, right. You may not, may not have been able to use right. it. Use the worm. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, just, I finally catch this fish. Sort of elusive <laughs> fish. And we're so blind with, oh my gosh, I got the fish, I got the fish. I like, did get a cut. picture. A Colorado Whoa, cut, this is going to be one. so great. And we get it, we get the picture, I'm super smiley, and now we can move on, we can go get the... F- and we get up there and we show the guys, hey, look, I caught... Oh no, wasn't it like a brookie? It was a brookie. <laughs> It was dark. We to were be so fair, excited. Was I was so excited to have caught it that it was like I just, we just didn't even identify it. We were we were just sure. No, that's that. They're only Colorado. Colorado cut. That's, that's, probably, that's probably the Bear River cut. That's oh. probably what they classify as Bear River. Cut. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the Bear that's River brutal. Brutal. Man. Man. Yeah, I know that's rough, and I know there are people because I've heard feedback from them that have said no. There is absolutely a Bear River cutthroat. Or they've said actually they're pretty closely related, not necessarily. So, I had said the Bonneville, and yeah, they're the more Bonneville. closely related to the Yellowstone. Actually. You just have to ask yourself the question: Do you want the medallion or not? Because I don't know you if might I want have a great much. argument. Mm. But if you want the <laughs> medallion, the you medallion just got to accept Utah's you accept yeah. game yeah. and go yeah. with it. There's there's so, you know, I love for, all these. I love all these slams. No, they're I, awesome. And they're, these are fun, and they're such a great way to get people. Plus, yeah, it, that's exactly it. The whole idea behind it is just to mm-hmm. get people. Like out Nebraska there. has an upland bird slam now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just saying. But Utah's had that for a while. Utah started patterning these slams, and then now you know Nebraska's the jumping on. There's slams for everything now, right? right. I and them. I think it's, I think it's great. I mean, I'm never going to complete. I'll hardly complete any of them. But I think it's a great recruitment tool, right? Oh, it's just to get fun. people out because it's, it's fun. It's fun, right. and then, yeah. for it's me, incentivizing, or, and it's yeah. a reward for effort. And we made some awesome friends that day because, like, the yeah. Utah fisheries and wildlife yeah, people they, that were out there, they were they fantastic, were amazing. They were fantastic yep. people. They've got some great, great people there. Um, that, you know, that spe- invested a lot of time in trying to help us get and stream connectivity. Line. Okay, so I'm like Iowa, Riparian State, water everywhere. And when yes. you go out someplace like that and you see this little braid of water and what lives in it and what needs to connect to some, I mean, you really yes. it, it it again it goes back to getting out in the resource. Yeah. I can never turn it off because while we're out there having this great time chasing down these little trout, I cannot stop thinking about. And and I was talking the whole time with those biologists about, you know, what are your issues? What are your challenges? And I couldn't stop thinking about the policies and all the land use policies that affect this one little trout being in this one little place. It, it, isn't it kind of amazing? So, you know, you all spend a lot of time, all of us here, uh, we all spend a lot of time in the outdoors, basically all of our free time. The perceptions that we have when we're out there, I, I mean, I think you're starting to touch on it because of what we do professionally we maybe look at the outdoors a little bit differently mm-hmm. right I, you know i'm i don't know about you i'm i'm walking out and i'm looking at what where a fence corner comes together and i'm thinking of the corner crossing laws yeah, mm-hmm. or right. uh-huh. or interpreting that stuff right i think that's right. what you're gonna say right. <laughs> like i'm trying to figure out if i can get to that other corner without actually trespassing right, <laughs> right. And, and you know and you're you know we're constantly as wildlife lawyers i think thinking about the resource in a little bit different way and our experience on the landscape might be a little bit different than some other folks's experiences but doesn't make ours right versus wrong one experience different than the other it's just i think it's just kind of a it's kind of a neat thing that we all you know we can see the same things Mm -hmm. and see the same things so differently i actually had a nightmare that i shot a deer out of season Recently, can I, play like, a game? I woke up in the middle of the night and sweat. Yeah. Can I play a game with you guys? <laughs> all we've got the four attorneys here, and I'm going to say that you guys may not be able to answer this question. 
But if you guys have more questions, people listening to this podcast, if you have more questions like this, I'd encourage you to please send them in so we can ask these types of questions. So we had a unique thing happen several years ago. I was up in uh, Grand Teton with uh, David Villa, who, by the way, congratulations. Yeah, right. New uh, director of the National Park Service. Yeah. Our, our That's right. friend, yeah. like high five to him. He was, uh, he was uh, at Grand, uh, Grand Teton. He was the superintendent of Grand Teton yep. National Park and we were for doing, a lot of years. We did a yeah. uh, we brought one family from every western state to the to the Great Outdoors Western Camp Out. Um, in, in association with the Western Governors Association, we had uh, a bunch of folks ponied up from you know Coleman uh, and a bunch of other outdoor companies. That brought all these families camping in Grand to say Teton, Coleman's, Kansas. It's a Kansas couple. They were great. <laughs> they were fantastic. So got to plug my state. That's great. So we were out there um, with these families, uh, staying at, at uh, with Alex Klein and his folks at the at the lodge out there. So anyway, they, they were staying in tents, so they weren't at the lodge. The right. lodge was close by. Right. Right. So anyway, here's what happened. So one of the companies that was a sponsor of the event was a firearms company, and so they came. Um, they came from uh, communities, Wyoming Arms. They came and they drove through. Um, Yellowstone to get to um, where the event was. And one of the owners, uh, one of the families was like, you won't believe what we saw. We drove up in the park for the day and this is what we saw. So, tell you what they saw, then here comes your hypothetical. A ranger is out there in the middle of the road. They got a buffalo traffic jam, right? Going on? Okay. And so they're out there in the middle of the road and a buffalo... Uh, the rangers trying to shoot the buffalo off the road. It, I, I can't remember whether they died, but like this buffalo just goes after and is just like giving it to this ranger, putting him into the asphalt. Did not like, die. That would have made the news. So yeah. yeah, I mean, people get hurt. So anyway, people get hurt yeah. for sure. No, people die. People buffalo kill people. Let's let's, let's so that, for people no, that don't think no, that that's happens. you know, no, you're right. So the, you're right. But so in the this firearms, instance, it, so the firearms yeah. guys were like. If I would have seen that, because you can drive through Yellowstone National Park with a rifle in your now. car. Yes. Mm-hmm. At the, and you, you could at the time. So they're like, I mean, yeah, that's a recent phenomenon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the question is this. If you were driving through Yellowstone National Park, private citizen going from one place to another, and you witnessed a buffalo about to end this ranger, what would you do? Oh, this is like that question they asked you in ethics about: Would you switch the the, the train track to save the one person or the? <laughs> yeah, right. What, what would you do in Yellowstone National Park? And maybe, and you don't have to answer. I'm just saying it's an interesting question, right? It's an interesting ethical question. It's like let me let me let you me have a clean add shot? a layer. Let me add a layer. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to add a couple of layers of this yeah, because that's what lawyers do, right? We add a couple of layers to this to to get <laughs> what it. What do you do? So is this just? Immediately prior to the attack, or it's, is it's it occurring. during it's the attack? During or is the it attack. After? So no, it's, it's during the so attack. So the attack is going on. Yeah, I kill the buffalo. It, I yeah, kill the bison. Right. Yeah. No hesitation. Not, kill it. not for a second. Protect that person. Yep. Right. No hesitation at all. And then we start the argument about what we do with the meat <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and the and throat, the like the, and the head. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> it, if it's in November, then the hide's good. Right. Isn't that winter interesting? Coat, right? It, right. I mean, but like, literally, you think about that. It's like, huh? No, I think that's a no-brainer. Yeah, I think that's easy. I question. think that's a no-brainer. Yeah, you're not. Now, what to- if it were the last two bison on Earth, male <laughs> and female, who were both going to attack this guy, and you could get one shot? You could get now, both. come on. One of these was a situation that was <laughs> actually occurring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think hypothetically, if, if you have, if you have a clear shot. If there are no other people at risk, because often around these bison jams in the park, you've got people everywhere. I, first, I thought you were going to say if there were no other people there to watch. I no, thought that's no, what no, you were no, 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 no. I was. I, I was going <laughs> to say if there are no other people at risk, if you were to take that shot, <laughs> right? And if you are competent in your with your shooting skills, I think that's a critical component, right? You got to be competent, a competent shooter. But if you have an opportunity to save that person's life. Yeah, no brainer. No brainer. You, Save you that brainer. Now, and here's, and here's just an interesting book. question. So what's like? Are you going to be? Man, I can only imagine the level of paperwork slash 
keeping that magistrate who lives in Yellowstone I, National Park busy. <laughs> I have a question for you. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to answer. You, you may not have an answer. I have a question for all of you. Uh huh. In all seriousness, this is the last question I think we're going to really have time for. Well, we haven't even gotten to something else, too. But I, okay. I, I know, but we're on the we're next. Run out of time. I, <laughs> on the next, we're not. <laughs> yeah. Two weeks from now, yeah. when we uh, do this again. No, no. So here is a. I'm going to do this a hypothetical, but I can almost guarantee that something like this has happened somewhere. And it involves trail cameras, right? Uh, have you all, I mean, have you all been dealing with, just quick yes or no, dealing with, have you dealt with trail cameras in your capacity as an attorney for your yes. agency? Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, no. No. Sorry, Nephi. Uh, uh, here, so here's the, here's the hypothetical. And how do you advise your client in this situation? Trail cam set up on a tree on public land. That doesn't exist in Kansas. I'm just <laughs> starting that. I thought you have 2% or something like that. Right. Okay. You have 2%, 2% public land, right? <laughs> Trail cam on a tree, public land, maybe you're a mile from a road, something like that, right? Again, doesn't yeah, okay. exist in Kansas. <laughs> we have roads everywhere. We're, we're doing hypotheticals right. here. Right? I mean, you can only be a half mile from the road, no right. matter where. So you're in Alaska right. now. So we're, <laughs> we're doing hypotheticals. Yeah. What a, stop. <laughs> this is hypothetical. <laughs> Everything about this, I you're guess. You're ruining it. Yeah, you're really, it's messing up my setup here. Okay, so you have a, a trail cam on a tree, uh, a mile, two miles back in the woods, right? You have one of your game wardens is suspicious about somebody with a bear bait site or a potential illegal baiting site of some sort, right? You want to catch them in the act. Um, and so you're setting up an operation and say, hypothetically, your warden is out there and accidentally triggers that camera. And now there's a picture of that warden on that camera, right? What do you tell them if they come to you and say, I took that memory card out and deleted the pictures of me and put it back in the trail camera? And then completed I'm my sure this investigation. So I, I feel like that. No, I feel like this is a personnel <laughs> question, this and we can't discuss Ryan. this. Does it rhyme with like Schmave Schmilms? <laughs> <laughs> no, this was actually a, a, a true hypothetical presented to me when I was when I was doing trainings for. I, I was doing. I, I used to do training at the law enforcement academy for game wardens, and we'd run through a bunch of hypotheticals of what you could and could not do with search and seizures. Yeah. You know, you know, search and seizure law and how open fields doctrines apply and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And this was one of the questions that we kind of worked through. And I was just kind of curious how you'd handle it. I'm just putting you on the spot. Did he cut the lock off the case to get to the camera inside? Hypothetically. Because that's another <laughs> I have this friend. Yeah. Complexity. No, that does it. Anyway. You know, that makes me think, though, you could do a whole episode on open fields doctrine. Yeah. You're right. I mean... Right. For You're right. wonky Ma right. attorney nerd, <laughs> not even just attorney nerd. I mean, so so people that are hunting know understand, their, understand their rights mm -hmm. and know right. know expect know the expectations in the field, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then there's also where is there a right to privacy, privacy. Uh, for personal property? Do you if it's on private land, do you have a right to privacy for the contents of that camera? Does that right to privacy change right. when it's on public land attached to a tree uh, that anybody can anybody walk can by and go see? And use. And, right. you know, it's like a tree stand on public land. Right. right. So it's an interesting hypothetical. I'm not going to answer it here. I'm, right. leaving, I'm just leaving it out yeah, there like a turd in the punch bowl. That's exactly <laughs> what she should, should get. Make all of our listeners listen to that whole thing and then wonder for the rest of their lives what the answer was. What's the answer? Well, there is no clear well, answer. Uh, every good lawyer will say it depends. It depends, yeah, right. There's more facts to know. I well, what's the best lawyer lot say? Lot it's a personal, you can do it if you don't get personal caught. matter. That's yeah, right. there you go, Chris. Which is the not the lawyer. good advice yeah, no, that, that I would give to advice. my client. Yeah. That is not good advice. Uh, well, no, it's going to be subject to state law as well as to how they've defined search and seizure and evidence. It, yeah, accessing what? Yeah, is it locked? Is it not locked? It might be is guided it by. A it might be guided by federal closed container constitutional law. Or not. Right. Well, well, constitution. Const well, of case course. Law. But what I'm saying is, like, if your state, like Iowa, is trending, is becoming more conservative. So we interpret the Fourth this Amendment is how right. as a providing <laughs> more protection. Because those of us who aren't like. 
how are we going to make our way around this question rather than like <laughs> let's let's deal with the we'd be like we're going to nuance we're going to pretend like we never did that <laughs> <laughs> yeah who's going to find out just do it right that's as the, an aside we did answer. go to Yellowstone this summer we took our kids to Yellowstone yep. Kelly and I and we had an awesome trip and we saw a bison and we made a list of all the wildlife we wanted to see and we left the last day of the park thinking Oh, we didn't see the wolves. We didn't make it to the part of the park where there were the wolves. We saw everything else. We saw grizzlies. We, I mean, it was amazing. Caught lake trout. Caught lake trout. Yeah. Went out, you know, went out on the boat and did our part to to eradicate <laughs> lake trout. And uh, oh, as we're leaving the park, I look over and I see this group of bison, and I see these coyotes running up to it. And, those are really big coyotes. Right. Wait a She's minute. Like, Look, there's a coyote. Those are wolves. Yeah. Like, pull over. And we <laughs> Little known totally fact. freaked out. Our coyotes kids. don't usually travel in packs. <laughs> right. right. Or right. drag yeah. down buffalo <laughs> right. or right. bison. Yeah. So there were these two wolves there's that were. There's a size issue there, right? <laughs> And then the giant radio collar yeah. gave it away. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, we don't, spend, we don't spend a lot of money radio collaring coyotes. <laughs> right. But our kids were more excited to watch us freak out about yeah. the wolves because yeah. like they were excited to see the wolves and they took pictures themselves but we were giddy and got some good video right. of it. We were like the first car on scene. So Oh, so you were we at the start of the that line. Yes. We started the you traffic started the jam. Traffic jam. Yeah. And everyone yes. was happy to have it. And we were right there, just kind of going five Nobody miles jumped an hour in front right of us. We just moved forward slowly, move forward, move forward. It was yeah, awesome. So on the way out, we saw neat. we saw wolves, a black one. And, and a, then we rounded the corner and we saw a yellow-bellied gris- marmot and then a grizzly <laughs> bear. Right. Oh, wow. One of the, one of the 50 what grizzly bears you counted that day. <laughs> right. That's no, We were down by Fishing Village. And so, or fishing, fishing bridge, fishing bridge, yeah. yep, fishing bridge. And so that's where we saw the wolves. I mean, not where we would have expected them. We had been at the Grand Canyon uh, mm. of the Yellowstone, and then came down there and I, I, heading back to Cody. I think we've bored Tamara a little bit. <laughs> She's like, so right. there, I no only shopping. like Yellowstone. No, I don't she drive Yellowstone. <laughs> Yellowstone <laughs> yeah. to with the Mr. campsite yes. with Mister Bubbles. So, should go. man, we could we could keep doing this forever and ever and ever. Um, I well, since give, I'm going to sleep, and this is my room. I know. I wanted to give everybody, <laughs> if there was something they felt like they missed, didn't have an opportunity to say. Because we, we already know what your mountain is. If everybody listens to your last episode, we know what your mountain is. But is there anything else that you'd like to say, that you'd like people to know about being a wildlife attorney? I wouldn't so much talk about being a wildlife attorney, but just wildlife professionals in general. Just how hard they work how passionate they are for the resource. And as an attorney that worked with them, it was always a pleasure to have clients who, I mean, we didn't always agree. We saw the world differently, but it's such a pleasure to work with people who are doing great things for the resource. So I hope that people appreciate there aren't just wild animals in the woods. There's a lot of interaction between people and animals and disturbances and there's so much that happens because people are researching and managing and talking and coordinating and so sometimes litigating. I'll mm-hmm. tell you this really quickly before we go on. Our demographics show that most of the people listening to this, we got a lot of wildlife professionals who are the ones that are listening to this. Really? Mm. Yeah. Well, I would just echo and say, I feel incredibly privileged to work with the wildlife professionals every day and all of the other staff at the DNR. Like Chris mentioned earlier, I'm very, there are a lot of uh, unhappy lawyers and that is not my experience in practicing law whatsoever. And I don't take it for granted. The irony is I went to law school so I could be a sole practitioner so I could hunt and fish on my own schedule. (laughs) And now I work in wildlife. But we, you know, we have 49 year employee right now. Which is amazing. Mm-hmm. We had, and when I first started, we had 35 and 40 year employees. We'd give out these awards at commission meetings. Mm-hmm. And that's the dedication of those people. I'm like, man, if I make it two or three years here in this agency, and now it's been 20. <laughs> but we have people who are, I'm just a pup. Yeah. yeah 20 it, years. Some of my best friends work in this field. Right. And I think that's why they're such good friends. Right, because there's this mutual respect and admiration for what people are doing for the resource. There's a an understanding of the level of commitment that's involved, and also, 
you know, some of the criticisms that everybody has to endure because there's a there's some lack of understanding out there about mm-hmm. what is wildlife management. I mean, while if we're all wildlife attorneys, right? But wildlife or or natural resource attorneys, but wildlife biologists, wildlife managers, uh, folks in that community. Um, I can't think of another profession where everybody else out there, if they hunt or fish or recreate, says, oh, I'm a wildlife, like the armchair biologists, right? Where you're criticized for every decision you make or don't make because the public thinks they know better because they they hunt or fish and the public knows a lot they do know a lot especially a public that recreates but it's a uh I mean, it's almost like a fraternity of sorts um or not to be misogynistic the sorority of sorts or just some <laughs> sort of collective group of people that all have similar affiliations <laughs> uh but it's a it's a it's a really cool thing and i've just been i've felt so blessed to be it, you know part of the community even just a small part just so and i can, can see it in everybody's kind of see face what's going on. these four are hugging right now i'm having to watch this it's a little disturbing <laughs> from my perspective but um it does you know uh for me having uh, you know having had the opportunity to work with you know dave for what five four five years something like that um man it's it's uh Certainly, there. It's nice to know that um, you know, the people with that dedication, that level of passion, um, out there doing that work, who are also legal geeks. We are all that. Right. That's true. <laughs> Some, somebody who actually thinks so. that it's that they want to talk about the Endangered Species Act for a minimum of three episodes. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> 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 I know. I, you couldn't do it justice in three episodes. I mean, I, I, don't know I felt like we needed more. Conversation yeah. justice I know. In three episodes. There's so many stories we didn't even tell. I know. But alas, we'll just we have to barely do it. even scratch the surface of like our outdoor adventures. I know. Right. So we'll just have to do it again another time. Bears and because birds and I know. Or all the like Kelly's funny, quirky the bird. cases. And she killed the bear. We didn't oh, even talk, we didn't about, even talk about the quirky cases. Oh, right. Can you believe that? You can't make up these facts. You can't make this up. I think we have send us questions. Maybe we'll start a new segment. We're like a cold. We'll do a cold call. We'll cold call Chris, or we'll cold yeah. call Kelly. Well, we'll be like today's cold call comes from Doug McDougson <laughs> in Wisconsin. <laughs> Doug wants to know. I have a friend yeah. who did this. <laughs> How long is going to go to jail for? <laughs> right. In, in all s- Chris. <laughs> in, in, in all serious though, seriousness though, Nephi, you, this is a great place, great way to wrap it up. I think we do have an email address. You know, your mountain, y o u r mountain, at itsyourmountain dot com. Send us an email. Tell us, you know, if you have questions. Shoot us some questions. We're happy to try and find the answer to them. If you have ideas for future podcasts, shoot us an email. Let us know what your thoughts are. Or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. All the handles there are at It's Your Mountain. Uh, no, it's not. It's at Your Mountain. No, it's yeah, it is. It's at It's Your Mountain. Man, I'm getting tired. It's at It's Your Mountain. You need to ask the question again. You want me to ask the question one yeah. last time? You know, I you shift as a... As a Parent, right? I shifted, but ask what her mountain is. Individual, because as a parent, okay. you have that initial. I I like the bobber and worm, right? Yeah, yeah. but you have an back. individual. But I have an individual, not a dad. Okay, an individual. Okay, okay. Let's let's do that. Let me first finish getting this handle right. <laughs> At it's your mountain. Send us some feedback on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Let us know if you have ideas for future podcasts, uh, things you want to, questions you want answered. Let questions us know. Questions that you'd like a legal answer to, and then I'll be happy to give you the practical. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Translation. So, so we'll do that. We'll do that. Just I, delete the picture. Yeah. Well, Just we'll, kidding. Yeah, you okay. <laughs> okay. So in all seriousness, Kelly, what's your... What's your mountain? Your non-kid. My my other your other, other mountain, mountain in the range. Your other mountain. 
Okay, so um, I grew up a military brat, and so kind of lived all over the place. Um, but my family was always in Galveston, Texas, and there was this wonderful little place that I think sometime in like the 50s was filled in wetland along the intercoastal waterway there just in Galveston. And, uh, and so you couldn't replicate this today because you could never get the fill permits. But there was this little camp that was a house on stilts, nothing, fr- nothing frilly. Um, and it's where I learned how to crab with a string and a turkey neck. Going across the street into the ditch and, and learning how to pull the crab in, trick it, get it with the net. We'd have the trap set in the bayside. And every day at the end of the day, have a big crab boil with all the family there. And that was an amazing, amazing place. It was wiped out in one of the last hurricanes. Stilts are still there, still belongs to the family. So I might get that mountain back one day. That's cool. Wow. That's awesome. We should have had you go last. <laughs> I know. I'm like. Because now it's become anticlimactic. <laughs> right. Right. I'm Chris. Done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I, I'd like to ask you to top that in all seriousness. Yeah, sure. So, you know, becoming a parent and ch- that changes things. And I have a 10 year old. Uh, and so I have the mountains that I had before and this talk about slams and quests and I do little ones, but I also do big ones. And, you know, I've tried to, in Kansas, I hunted lesser prairie chickens, greater prairie chickens, scaled quail, bob whites and pheasants. I mean, that was the, the Kansas slam. And I specifically went after certain things like that. And then, you know, as my old lab was in his waning years, I was chasing species with him to try to get as many species with him before he passed away and those types of things. So for me, my personal uh, one that I started many years ago that got sidetracked because I became a parent uh, was to hunt on every continent. And I've been to Africa and I've been to Asia to hunt and fished and I shot birds in Africa too. Uh, so I'm halfway there. You'll never do Antarctica, but next year, uh, my plan is to go to Argentina. I'm going to start it back again. That's awesome. It's just been kind of sidetracked, yeah. but you know, and you do these mountains with your kids too. So, yeah. so I'm a, I was on a 10 year hiatus, but now I'm back again. Nice. Yeah. That's awful. It's exciting. Yeah. Tamara, what do you got? One of my, so I will pick a location as opposed to a feeling. And my location is going to be McKinnon Pass, which is on the Milford Trek, which is on the South Island in New Zealand. And it's a 33.5 mile backpacking trail that takes you down to the Milford Sound, which leads you out to the Tasmanian Sea. And my husband and I backpacked that on our honeymoon. And McKinnon Pass is the highest point. And, uh, like, the world just falls away from you when you're... Uh, you zigzag, there's like 13 hard, steep switchbacks and you're going up this mountain and all of a sudden you just like crest over and there's sort of some water basins that form in the rock and there's some big peaks around you. But then basically the world, it's just like, it just falls away from you and it's just an incredible location. And obviously it has sentimental reasons since it was, a we've had many adventures together, but it was our, our first big adventure as a married couple. Was that 13 switchbacks, fun one, fun two? That was... With fun one being all fun, fun <laughs> right. two being fun when you're done. Right. And fun three three being not fun not at all. Fun. Not fun at all. Never fun. Um, I, that one was probably fun too. <laughs> But, right. but, 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 but now you're borderline to fun about it. one. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Doing it not uh, so on fun. that 1. track, 5. actually, um, <laughs> Terry, my husband, actually injured himself pretty soon. Seriously, he fell off the the trail at one point um, and plunged his trekking pole into his calf. And so, yeah, we had some remote woods first aid that had to happen and and all sorts of... That's a story for a different day. But that part of it was fun three. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. When you try to kill yourself on your honeymoon. That's fun three. three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so. Final thoughts from you, Nephi? Um, final thoughts. Wisdom. 
find your mountain. You know, make sure that you're trying to do it every day. I think what what fulfills us as people um, is that search, and that is what really. I mean, it can't be found in a video game. It can't be found in virtual reality. It's something that's real, and it's only found by being there and doing something with it—a place that is special to you and with people that you care about. And so, that's the that's my final thoughts. Go search for your mountain. That's it. I think couldn't say it any better. I want to thank you all. You've taken a lot of time. It is late, but maybe it's early, <laughs> it's depending two weeks on. Later. It's early. Yeah. It's, it's early. early. It's now early. No. Uh, but thank you all. Um, you know, I said we're going to take opportunities. You know, you know, take opportunities when they present themselves. Tomorrow, we're going to do that. We're going to go out and fish uh, here in the in the bay outside of Tampa, Florida. Uh, so, obviously, we'll see you in the morning. And everybody else, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Mike here from the Your Mountain Podcast. We need a favor. Go on our website, itsyourmountain.com, and find the links to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so that you can like and follow us, and also so that you can share us with your friends. Wherever you got this podcast from, go ahead and click subscribe, rate us, and leave a comment. These simple things will really help us get the word out. That's itsyourmountain.com. Thanks for the help.